I'm trying to create a live stream and, and uh, having an issue uh, for Facebook and trying to figure out why. Um, I'm just going to have to restart everything and, and try to start it again. I'm not sure quite what happened, but uh, we will try this one more time. We will be posting it on a page, which is Stephen Winsett, an author. Now, we want a live video. And we're waiting for it to load up. So this is all new for me, of course. Um, and the first time I've done this, so I am getting the hang of what needs to be done and how this is going to work. Okay, so that's set up. Um, title. This is a partial premillennialism. And uh, I did thought I had this all ready to go. It goes to show you, in real life things don't work out the way they're supposed to. And I will be we, dealing with uh, Kenny Gentry's book, Navigating the Book of Revelation. And then, uh, let's see. I don't need that anything. Okay, we want to. All right. Okay, it says we're going live and we should be live right now. And uh, it's starting the broadcast. We'll see how long it takes. Uh, let me expand it just a bit. Hopefully this will get working. Okay, I am now live, according to uh, Facebook, on Stephen Witsit's author page. Okay. With that said, and with that all done, um, I introduction here. I am uh, a post-millennial, post-tribulation, pre-millennial um, believer, and... Uh, uh, this is basically the studies I've been engaged in the last eight years since I first heard of Protestant. And, uh, well, I'll tell you the truth. Boy, it shocked me when I first heard about full Protestant and started to engage people. And I couldn't believe that people actually believed the things that I was listening to and, what, and to what I heard. So, uh, I've gotten on different pages and had many discussions from Don Preston. Oh, all the way, th I, I mean, William Bell on his radio program, John Watts on his Tuesday night show, I've been on there. But he eventually blocked me completely, as did Don Preston. Uh, and I mean, when they, um, after some talking with him and everything else, they definitely, definitely, definitely uh, blocked me. And when I exposed kind of their duplicity in what they were saying with some of the things they did, and, uh, but especially John Watson is not able to argue back. So, of course, he uh, totally blocked me. And he says, I'm one of the three. Uh, but at no time have I, have I ever been rude to any full preterist, um, except maybe uh, Roy Running, who, is, who has deliberately, um, let's, let's say, mischaracterized things that I've said. He deliberately misstates what I said. He is deliberate in his evilness and the things that he's done uh, to me. And so when he did that last uh, conference, of course, I don't know if anybody has seen that, he put up the, uh, what is it, uh, a, a video in the background with a meme of me and several other people's faces on, and was like, we're doing Twister, and we're twisting scriptures, and uh, definitely not so. But, but Roy Runyon just does not have the mental capacity, I think, to actually listen to what somebody says. So, um. I, uh, okay, yeah, I think the comments are open. 
so I can get that on Facebook. That should come if you go live on, uh, on my author's page. So that is live. And then the Spreaker, of course, you'll just, yeah, you're just watching that. All right, now, um, I wish you could see the video. And I don't think we can set up a, a, a different screen or background screen. Um, no, I don't. Uh, it won't do it. I uh, can't share the screen with this. I know with OBS I was able to, but not here. And uh, but I I'm on two of the uh, pages that I'm on and where I've been interacting. The, the first one is a victorious eschatology. It is partial preterism or something close to it. And I put up, of course, my advertising for for tonight and, and uh, the idea that I'll be releasing my book on December 1st. Uh, hopefully we'll get it fully edited and everything's done with it by the time we get. We got, I got several people that are looking it over. Um, so I put it up there and somebody comes back right away. Uh, but classical premill is not victorious eschatology. And I just kind of, I kind of, what do you mean victorious? The church is not victorious? Well, yeah, of course it's victorious in premill. I mean, I mean, that is the main issue about premill is, is that Jesus returns. And when he returns, he returns to earth. And that's according to Zechariah 14. He, you know, people come year after year to Jerusalem to worship the king. Um, Revelations 20, you know, Jerusalem becomes the camp of the saints, uh, which, and, and see, that's different than, of course, when you're trying, you're trying to uh, tie it in with uh, partial preterism. And partial preterism, of course, tries to tie everything in all together in 70 AD, all the revelations was fulfilled. Uh, we'll get into that in a moment. But, uh, you know, when I'm trying to explain these things, people come in with their questions and their ideas of how they think they can get you. And, most of the times it just doesn't work what they're what they're trying to do and it's because there's some scriptures that they're totally missing and and i think uh zechariah 12 and 14 are two of the main main passages that people are missing and forget they uh how do you put it i don't know the, the, into their their things um it's okay so on uh, chat i'm on spreaker i can see chat if anybody comes on here and joins me a little thing that comes up here. Feels lonely in here. Be the first to send a message. So I'm on Spreaker.com underneath uh, Full Moon Podcast is where you can find me at. So uh, she was on, no, partial partners in post-millennialism. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, yeah, that's what I'm basically, she's saying no to it. And I'm not a full preterism. This group is based on partial preterism which I'm fully aware of. I've been on this group for quite a few, quite a long time now, so two or three years, but I, I have not really commented a lot and not wanting to get into it. And uh, um, because of the comments and the things that we get into, um, I'm not sure. I guess it depends on if you believe we are in Christ's kingdom now. Well, yeah, of course we're in Christ's kingdom now. He rules and reigns uh, sovereignty over the earth and nations, but he doesn't force them as an iron... Because if he was a force, you know, there'd be no Islam. There'd be nothing but Christianity across the whole globe. So he allows people right now. but And then one day he, of course, will come down. What did he ask his disciples to pray is, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, so as in heaven, it's being done. But here on earth, it is not yet. And uh, that will eventually have a uh, much broader implications for later on. She goes on to say, I'm not sure. I guess it depends on if you believe we are in Christ's kingdom now, right? So, uh, so do you believe the Great Commission won't be successful? And I'm, I'm, When you look at the Great Commission, it says what? Go out and preach to all the nations. Where does it say in the Great Commission that everybody is going to get saved and all nation, nations are going to become saved and they're going to be all Christians? Uh, and it says that it says go into all the nations and preach the word and make disciples of all nations. Do we currently have disciples in every nation, in every people groups, in every tongue group? Yeah, the the, the gospel is spread. It's it's totally has been all over the place. Uh, she goes and say, yeah, John says he is a part during the tribulation and revelations. Well, of course he was in the part. You know, now 
maybe it's better I I do a little bit more preliminary before we get too far here. Here's where I differ from traditional dispensational premillennials and those kind of things. I thoroughly believe that the Olivet cannot be divided into two parts. It can't be. Um, it is has to be completely fulfilled in 70 AD. And this is the same view as N.T. Wright and many other top scholars are coming to this as they look at it and really examine it. Because the idea is, is that the Olivet never talks about a second coming. So you can have everything in the Olivet be fulfilled in that generation. There's no problem with that. Because it never talks about a second coming, there's nothing about it that has to do with the second coming. Um, and I'll explain it real quick. Uh, on my YouTube channel, you'll find all kinds of videos there, and, and I've gone over it more. But we've got time here. Um, let me do it. The idea is, is that whenever you hear the language of uh, Son of Man coming on clouds, Jesus is quoting from the uh, book of Daniel 7, 13, and 14. And uh, I could pull up scripture. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to try to do it from memory, but, you, you know, paraphrase a little bit there. But it says in there, And the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days on the clouds, um, came through the clouds, the Son of Man, he, and he was pre presented before the Ancient of Days. Uh, and the whole idea of that passage is, is that he came in to heaven, and in heaven, he's come to the ancient days in heaven. He sits down at the right hand of the Father, and then he is being given the kingdom when he ascended. So we know that Christ, when he ascended, that's when he sat down. That's when he was given the kingdom, and uh, he starts to rule over uh, over the whole earth in that in that capacity. Now, when you look at other passages where it says the Son of, you will see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That again is still talking about his ascension his kingdom was in heaven that's where it started that's where he sat down at the right hand is when he came into his kingdom um, and the best example of that language would be from matthew 26 when he was arguing with caiaphas what did he say he said from now on from this point forward after here you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the father and coming on clouds so how do you sit and come on clouds at the same time see it's not talking about coming down coming in clouds is a is a like from psalms 110 it is a a uh, language that talks about the coming of judgment so because christ ascended to the throne and said the right hand of the throne then he is the one who sends judgment now i've discussed this thing with with uh, roy one ear and out the other john watson um he flat out denies it, tries to go down to verse 21 of that chapter and say, see, see, this, the ancient of days, he's, he's coming down, he's coming down. But see, that specific passage is not about his coming down. It's about Christ's ascension. Um, and so there's nothing in the Olivet that talks about his second coming. People, you kind of kind of think, here's the first century, right? Here they are, Jesus in, in, in 23 is is talking to them, and he tells them that not one stone would be left upon another. He starts to talk about the judgment of Israel in in Matthew 23. And uh, maybe I should just pull it up because I can do it here on my um, on my computer very quickly. I think it's important we don't miss this whole idea. You know, technically, if, if people knew that, uh, like in, for instance, in Luke, the things that he says in the bit are spread out over several days, and you get the impression that he's more than once. And uh, so when you go to Matthew 24, he is trying to kind of condense it all and put it in, into one thing. So if we look at the end of chapter of Matthew 23, what does it say? Oh, Jerusalem, oh, well, we'll go back up before that. Send you the prophets and wise men scribes from you who you will kill and crucify. Some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town. So that on you you may become all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Berechai, whom you murdered between the sanctuary. This is Old Testament, isn't it? It's concerning the Old Testament prophets. So truly I see all these things will come upon this generation. I don't have a problem. Um... Your house is like you, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
We go into 24. So now he begins, uh, he makes a statement. You see all these, don't you, these beautiful buildings? And say, truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now, this was a common tactic of Roman uh, armies. So if you actually looked uh, looked up to how they did the sieges and what they did, um, when they came in and destroyed, they would literally tear down every block of stone so that nobody, very hard for them to rebuild. And it would take many years for them to rebuild. And remember, the, the temple was built by Herod. And if you look at the stones and the size of those stones, man, it's incredible how big this thing was. And, of course, it was overlaid in gold, and the gold had gone in between the cracks. So you know they're going to tear it down because they want the gold that was under there. Um, and that's some of that stuff is recorded by Tacitus, what they did. Some, I think, uh, it was Tacitus, but mostly Josephus, who talks about it and, and the glory of that temple. So what will be the sign of your coming, your parousia and the end of the age? So his coming brings about the end of something, this judgment on Israel. It's very common sense. If you're going to be destroying the temple, then you're destroying everything uh, that Moses had set up in, this, in, in the old covenant system. It's all going to be all coming down. So, of course, it's going to be the end of the age. Now, the word parousia is used in an Old Testament context. It later developed a, a, a bigger and a more technical meaning. But for right now, let's just suffice it to say that it was used in Septuagint to talk about, and Josephus used it in his words, to talk about armies that came on the behest of God to carry out judgment. So when the Babylonian come came to destroy Jerusalem, that was a parousia uh, because it was the coming of judgment by some physical, literal army that came to destroy Jerusalem. And so it, uh, literal, absolutely literal. So this is why I believe the Olivet is completely fulfilled. Now, when it comes to Revelation, um, I believe in the late date and I hold on to that. And so the late date is what um, separates it from anything we have in the Olivet. There are two completely distinct prophecies about two different times, two different events, and the whole nine yards. And, and that is some of the stuff that we're going to get into. And uh, I, as I went through on Victorious... I want to look through, I believe, uh, uh, the man of lawlessness, lawlessness is passed. She makes the claim for um, the Great Commission is work. Not all nations are disciples yet. You see, it never says all nations become disciples. It says there will be disciples in all nations. Uh, so, of course, she says the second coming is future. And then she says Revelation is not the second coming. Uh, that is not talking about it. And I've seen that. That came from Hokima, who wrote years and years ago. And then um, Botner, um, she also wrote about the post-millennial position, but not from necessarily a, a pre-millennial. Yeah, I, well, not from a, um, how do you say it, partial progress viewpoint. And... Uh, this book is pretty much, and uh, it talks about, she quotes somebody who says the same thing, that Galatians 19 is not about the second coming, and it just, it's absolutely astonishing that people can, can believe that, because they don't do the study. What people usually do is study a person, what he says, not the Bible. So, that's kind of my accusation, is for most of these people, they, they come at me hard with these things from come out, out of the blue, um, as if I, I'm saying that he doesn't reign until he makes all of his enemies fulfilled and it's going to grow like a mustard seed and, and all the, uh, yeah, I agree, but just not in the context you're thinking of. And that's the problem. I, there is a different understanding, a different viewpoint. When you look at a glass of water, is it half full or half empty? Um, you see it the way you see it, and that doesn't mean the other person is dead wrong the way they see it. It means you need to learn to see it by what they say. Well, this person went on, uh, there are many flaws with pre mill Christ is reigning now. See, and that's supposed to be something that we believe, and I've said it several times. No, Christ is reigning. Nobody's talking about he's not. Um, 
and it went on from there. Now, um, you mean a late date? Yes, I accept a late date. And one person got on. Sorry, we won't be reading your book or listening to your podcast. Your basic foundation is faulty. If you begin with the premise of a late dating of the authorship of Revelation, then your scholarship is flawed, and hence the whole pre mill thing. Now, uh, was there a response finally? Oh, yeah. You know that Domitian sat on the emperor's throne for nearly a year, right? Before the fall of Jerusalem? Uh, no. I, I've never seen anything. I've looked that up. I, I've not found any type of kind of proof or evidence for that kind of a statement. But hey, if you got something for me, show me. But no, there's no proof or evidence. Now, she wrote up there that the, your basic foundation is, is faulty. So let me just real quick go over some of the evidence for the late dating. Um, and this is quotes from Eusebius and quoting other people while he does this. But let me just read this. It says, Dimitching, having shown great cruelty toward many people, uh, finally becoming a successor of Nero in his hatred, he was in fact the second to stir up per persecution against us, although his father Vespasian had undertaken nothing prejudiced. So it is, it is said, in this persecution, the apostle and evangel evangelist John, who was still alive, was condemned to dwell on the island of Patmos in consequence of his testimony to the divine word. That's Church History, Book 3. Uh, the second witness, Irenaeus, in his fifth book, Work Against Us, where he discussed the number of the name of the angels, this weapon, which is given the so-called Apocalypse, John, speaks as follows. If it were necessary for his name to be proclaimed openly at the present time, it would have been declared by him who saw the revelation, for it was seen not long ago, but almost in our own generation, at the end of the reign of dimension. Now, before you say anything, I have read uh, Before Jerusalem Falls. I've read it. I know it backwards and forward. And if you don't know that in the second edition, he responds to actually other people, and some there's comments and things like this. And there's a couple of serious, serious flaws in, in what he says. But when it comes to that quote, Here's what people need to understand. Uh, Irenaeus, twice before, and Gentry notes this in his book, that he said that John lived until the time of Trajan. He lived until the time of Trajan. It's there. Um, let me, I got a, a message I want to get to. Maybe. Uh, I don't see any response. Okay. Um, I thought maybe there might be a message coming up or something, but uh, I'm not sure. I want to be able to be able to, to look on it. Now, where, yeah, I got to find this again. Oops. All right, we're opening it back up again. And, uh, but he goes on through any, any quotes. And so the idea is, is that Eusebius is pointing out what's been said by different people. And Irenaeus has pointed out they lived to the time of Trajan. So it doesn't make sense that he's saying, oh, we saw John in, in, during the time of Dimension. He, he's already seen him, Demen, uh, mentioned that he's seen him up until the time of Trajan. So that's not what's being seen. He's saying that it was the... Uh, apocalypse the vision that he saw at the time of dimension um and there's many things that goes on through there i'm seeing if i can get back to that thread because i had moved from it so i'm trying to go back to it um i'm back to it now okay i'm, I'm back there and Okay, chapter 20. So after Dimension reigned 15 years and never succeeded to the empire, the Roman Senate, according to the writers that record the history of those days, voted that Dimension's honors should be canceled and that those who had been unjustly banished should return to their homes and have their property restored. It was at this time that the Apostle John returned from his banishment in the island and took up his abode at Ephesus according to the ancient Christian tradition. Now, what do you mean by ancient Christian tradition? Uh, ancient meaning something that's a historical fact is the way the word is being used. Not in the sense of old, but 
old accepted by many people that this is the truth. Uh, that word had a different meaning back then than what we have now. Plain and simple on that one. Uh, the other claim is that Irenaeus is, is poor, you know, claiming that Jesus was lived until he's 50. But if you read Irenaeus, the quotes and the sections in there uh, about him living to being 50, if you read carefully, these, he actually says, this is his maturity level. This is how he was recognized as a rabbi and well-respected as if he was 50 years old. And and the big clue that he, you know that he's not saying he would went, live till he was 50 and then crucified. Uh, Irenaeus says it very plainly and very clearly within those chapters that Jesus saw and was alive in his ministry for three full Passovers where he was in Jerusalem. Three of them. And if you go back and read scriptures, he was there for three of them. The last one, of course, is when he was killed. Um, and here's the other interesting point that I should make. Chapter 23. At that time, the apostle and evangelist John, the one who Jesus loved, was still living in Asia, governing the churches of that region, having after returned after the death of Dimension from his exile. Now, he keeps repeating this, right? Why? Why would he think that he lied or got bad information for Irenaeus? Or from anybody else. But here's the real stickler for... And, and just look at this observation. You got a book written about... From from Kenneth Gentry. That he's... Looking at the quotes and all the evidence for the late date. All the things that were said by Eusebius, Clement. All these different people. Who are making the claim about dimension. Or mentioning it. Or it's put together as that way. And he goes down and dismantles each one of them with his arguments. Arguments doesn't mean it's true. He just presented arguments. It would have been much stronger if he had been able to go through and find even one quote from the early church or in those years afterwards, soon after, and not the title of a, a, some other copy, text, Masoretic, or... Uh, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm forgetting what it is, the Peshitta, where it says in the title that it was added into. See, titles were never put in the Bible. I, Revelations to John to Peter, nobody put in a title in the book. It just starts the way it starts. Um, so they did not put titles. We people do that. They did not do that. So you don't have not one testimony from anywhere or anyone that John was banished by Nero. Uh, nothing. Absolutely Nothing about it. Nothing about it. Uh, the other... Uh, somebody's still trying to respond. I don't know if they can get to it or not, if there's a problem. But uh, I have no clues if they if, if people are able to get on or not. Uh, I haven't seen anybody yet. So anyway, uh, historicists. Here's the big problem with historicism, and this is why it's quickly rejected by a lot of people from right off the bat. And uh, we're not going to have the discussion about that, but I'm going to try and find his post where he tries to tell me that the thousand years is part of 72 to 74 would be the thousand years, and so it ends with the Turks. Um, I'm going to see if he can, I can find it for him where he said that and I can't right off hand find it in the thread but this is under uh, historicism versus preterism, futurism and idealism and I've been on that one for several years as well and he's asking me about the kings and the heads who are the seven kings, who are the five that are, if you read the context it has nothing to do with that time period that's the way it's being read by people. And that's what it actually says. Uh, no, I can't. I can't find it right offhand. But the idea is, is that he says that the millennium is over. It ended in 1074 or thereabouts. And, um, that's kind of problematic if you think that's what happened. I'm just trying to see it, yeah. No, I can't find it right offhand. Um, it's a pretty long thread, so I'm not going to go through on everything. But the idea is, is that we're dealing with these things, and, and people are coming up with stuff that are just kind of 
blows me away. All right, um, switching gears. All right, what I've done is I've gone through the book, Navigating the Book of Revelations with Kenneth Gentry. And again, we might repeat some of the same things, but here's some of the quotes that I'm pulling out and I'll be uh, talking about. And the uh, first one comes from 188. He's, Kenneth Gentry states in his book, My former preterism holds that the vast bulk of Revelation focuses on the events leading up to and including the fall of Jerusalem, and the destruction of the temple in 87. This view is called preterism, which derived from the Latin preteritus, which means gone by past. Thus, the properties of revelation lie in the past. But when you press him on it, of course, he is only talking about 1 through 18. He is not talking about 19. He believes, um, if you believe, you know, that's one of those things I can't get clear from, especially from this book, if he believes all the prophecies, and then he's saying 19 is not about a second coming, but you have to have a second coming before you can have a great white throne judgment. You have to have a second coming before you have the arrival of the new heavens and the earth. So, going back to um, following the book, what he next goes into, of course, is the dating. And he says, the view that I will be defending is that Revelation was written by the Apostle John in 65 or 66, just after the outbreak of the neuronic persecution and just prior to the eruption of both the Jewish wars in 67 and the Roman civil wars in 68. Now, let me, let me go through the thought process logically on two reasons why this is fundamentally flawed. The first is, is that Nero was never recognized as somebody who, um, what do you call that word when you take exile somebody? He never exiled people. He killed them. Um, James, Peter, I mean, Paul, especially Peter and Paul, they killed him there. And uh, why would he, I mean, he killed his own mother-in-law, killed his boys because they didn't. he didn't want them taking over his throne. I mean, the man was absolutely crazy. Um, so why would he have banished John to an island after trying to boil him in oil? according to, you know, some of the traditions of what happened to him. Either way, if he did or didn't, the point is, is that we have plenty of evidence that shows that John lived until uh, to the time of Trajan, then that would have been 98, between 100 and 80. The uh, revelation then is claimed to have been seen while he was on the island. And then when he got off the island, he would have written it. So the idea is that if, and, and Eusebius brings this up, that those people that were exiled were brought back after the emperor died. That was common practice. Well, <laughs> Nero committed suicide in 68. So there's two problems with the interpretation of, of premillennial partial. The first one is, is that if he committed suicide in 68, then he wasn't killed in 70. And the scriptures is absolutely clear. And this is something that I can't get these people that I discuss with these things. And it just, I give up kind of in a sense because they don't, they're not honest with scriptures. It says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. And the lawless one will be revealed and killed by the appearing and the coming of Jesus Christ. I mean, by his coming and his appearance, he will be killed. Revelations 19, 19, and the false prophet and the beast were captured and they were thrown alive into the lake of fire. How can the beast be thrown alive? You say he came in 70 AD. That's when the second coming happened. How can you sit there and tell me that the beast was thrown alive in 70 AD when Nero committed suicide in 68? See, that doesn't work. Number two. The reign of the beast where he's given power over the nations and over what he does for 42 months. That's in Revelation 13. For 42 months. Okay. If this is Roman Empire, Jewish wars that they're talking about. Subtract the 42 months. Three and a half years from 70. You get 66 and a half. Now, he just said in Apostle John about 65 or 68. Six. So you have John going to the island and being released, coming back. And then who would have released him to come back to Ephesus? That's really the big clue. 
But he comes back in 65 or 66, and, and this is still just after the, the breakout of the, you know, Nuremberg persecution in 64. They hate Christians, but for some reason, this whole fur, John was released. You see, that doesn't make any sense. But he's supposed to have come back to Ephesus, make seven copies of, of his book, write it, make seven copies, and then have sent out to all the churches, all by 66 and a half AD. And actually, he actually, uh, in judging books, actually suggests even up to the time of 68, well, you don't write a book about things that will soon take place to you if they're already started. What kind of warning is there about the events that are take place if you get them after the events have already started, if the siege is already started? Who, why is this a warning if these judgments are coming down upon them that they don't get the warning until it's too late? And that's the one of the biggest problems. Um, of course, like I said, the lawless one will be killed by his coming. That didn't happen. There's nobody killed. Uh, you can't take this metaphorically and, and not literal. Because when you say in Revelation 19 that these two were thrown alive into the lake, literal language. Whatever makes the uh, basic most sense makes the most sense. Um, and so that is the problem with uh, Gentry's view. I've got about four minutes before my Spreaker wants to die, but I can continue with the Facebook Live and will do so. And uh, won't be a problem. Um, so those those are my basic two issues there. They ignore that verse in that passage that says that uh, he will be revealed. The lawlessness, the beast, will be revealed for what he is, the fake, at the coming of Jesus. And you've got him being killed in 68, two years before he came. So that creates a very impossible contradiction that cannot be reconciled by any argument. I do not care about what other arguments you want to bring. When you do that, you always you automatically lost the high position. You lost it. You lost it. Um, and... Uh, Okay, that all right. This is going to conclude my my speaker. They only allow me forty five minutes under my thing for the first print, print, and I'm not going to go back and, and put it on. It's Halloween, and I think a lot of people out there. So for those that are in speaker who listen through here, um, yeah. But we will continue it. There will be another episode that I will post the live. I'm putting it up it, just to let people know, and eventually they'll be able to join me when word gets out more and uh i want to react interact with people that's my main goal here is to get comments and people to interact and talk with me uh, without foolishness silliness i'm not here to call people names and tell you how you wrong you are i want to show scriptures and show why that position or what you're saying is a contradiction uh, because if, if you tell me the millennium kingdom that thousand years happened from 70 a.d to 10 or 1074 well then you have to have Christ come. You at the end of that, if you're post millennial, you have to have it coming. He has to come, and if you're pre, of course, then you're forcing that to happen right there in 70 A.D. His second coming. But both counts. There's not one testimony from anybody of the early church that ever believed that Christ returned, that there was a resurrection of the dead, or any other such thing took place, or that the events of Revelations were filled in the events of 70 AD. Uh, the first church, early church, all accepted the, the late date. It was something that was not even ar oh, excuse me, argued or brought up until much, much later. All right, for the you guys on uh, Spreaker, I'm going to say goodbye. And then from now on, yes, I'll be doing it on my uh, author's page. And uh, Stephen Wood's author, Underneath my Facebook, Stephen Woods, it, you can find it there. And we'll be able to go a lot longer since it is live. Um, eventually, maybe I can put it on YouTube and have that going too at the same time. I got two computers. I got three screens. Maybe we can make that work and we'll figure it out later. 
So you guys in Spreaker, thank you for coming and listening. And then, of course, you'll be able to get more from the Facebook page as we continue on.